the box seat, brought to you by our stable of sponsors. Hi everyone, Box Seat is back, yes, for 2023. Michael Guerin couldn't be a better time to come back off the back of Victoria's two big group ones at the weekend. And we've got the Fahey Fence Hire Breeders at Addington on Friday night. Can't wait for that. There's a lot going on, Greg. Um, before we say, we'll talk about what's getting forward, let's talk about what just happened. The season finished since we were last on the Box Seat and uh, there's been new Premiership winners crowned. We've had... A really busy January with a couple of New Zealand horses going to Victoria successfully and then unsuccessfully. And as you mentioned, the first group one for the season's just around the corner. Invites for the race have gone out. Some have gone out and then been rescinded. It's really hectic and I hope everybody's had a great start to their summer. We'll try and capture all that for you and give you some honest opinions on what's going on because there's a lot of opinions being banded around. Let's try and base some of them on fact. All right, let's paint the picture as to what you can expect on your box seat today. We'll wrap up season 2022, just have a look at some of the premierships and look forward to uh, the markets for this year's premierships. We've got a preview of that Group 1 action out of Addington and a very interesting mile race. We'll update you on Alexandra Park post the floods. John Denton's been up there and he gives us a great insight into that. We've got some milestones to tick off, including a first up a winner. Team Teal update, we'll go across the ditch with Garrards because there's so much happening there both in Victoria and in Sydney. We'll preview Summer Brecken yearlings and we'll have our hand milking best bets of the week. So we've got a lot for you. Let's wrap up the premierships uh, from last season. Here's the trainers premiership and congratulations to Team Telfer which has now become Team Telfer Cullen and of course Hayden Cullen was with the runners up with Mark Purden. So 98 wins over 94 massive it is for the whole Stonewall operation. Robert and Jenna Dunn two time premiership winner Robert Dunn of course another very good season for him the house team with 83, Greg and Nina Hope doing particularly well. Then we get to the ones, Michael, that you'll want to talk about. The newcomers, if you like. Bob Butt, so close to 50. Mark Jones, his normal uh, high strike rate. Matt Purvis at 44. And Arna Donnelly rounding out the top 10. Yeah, it's a lot harder, Greg, for those smaller stables to accrue those sort of numbers. And well done to Matt. Uh, to Bob, uh, Arna, I've been a big fan of for a long time. So really proud of, of those three stables. Also Team Telfer. This is a massive machine now since that premiership has ended and they have won their first premiership. Won't be the last. They've now headed to Menangle, which is the next step, Greg, for anybody who gets to that level. You eventually, you've got to expand into places to give your owners the best chances to make money. They've done that. They want to race yesterday. They want to race on Saturday night. Uh, Steve Telfer by no means finished with the backing of Steve Stockman and, of course, Jill and all of their syndicate of owners. So congratulations to them. That would have been a surprise a year ago. There weren't many people tipping Team Telfer as Premiership winners. No surprise, Gregory, in the Drivers Premiership. No, there wasn't, but we'll just have a quick look at the market for this season's trainer Premiership. $1.55 for Team Telfer, two forty for the Duns, and then Mark and Nathan Purden at $7.50. And what about the start the Dun stable has made? 26 wins in five weeks. On to the Drivers Premiership. And Blair Orange made it uh, five. Yes, a high five for him in terms of premierships uh, now. And uh, he did it pretty comfortably over uh, John Dunn, who had another very good season, 109. And Tim Williams with that final race of the season, Michael, getting to 100. Yep, great effort from Tim. Um, look down that list and Sarah O'Reilly at 70 wins is the one who really jumps out at you. I mean... A lot of names there that we know. Robbie Close also having a personal best season, but well done to Sarah. That's no mean effort. When you're not really attached to a stable where you're getting the best drives from uh, and you're having to sort of eke your way through the juniors ranks and taking on the older guys and girls in the senior ranks. So uh, Robbie Close and Sarah O'Reilly, two of the stars of the show. The top of the premiership table there, Greg looking very similar to last year and probably similar to what this year will be, albeit John Dunn has got off to a flyer 
as Blair has had a couple of weekends away in Australia. Yeah, leads him by five at this stage, but a dollar ten Blair Orange to win uh, the Premiership. John at six dollars, Tim Williams seven fifty, uh, and then you're out to uh, Zach Butcher at around at twenty one dollars. The junior drivers was uh, uh, Sarah O'Reilly, and she is favourite for this year. Uh, she got seventy wins last season, beat Ben Hope, Sam Thornley. Uh, and the likes of Carter Dalgetty. So 240 Sarah, 270 for Carter, three dollars Ben Hope and uh, Sam Thornley at about eleven dollars. So there's a good look at the premierships and the wrap up of those, and also uh, if you want to have a bet into this year's premiership. Right, Group One racing action out of uh, Addington. It's the Fahey Fence Hire ninety thousand dollar breeders. Here was the Garrard's Premier Mares Championship from the week before. This was a domination by Folklore. A big win for Johnny Cox, first as an individual trainer in a group race level, dashed away. There was a few unlucky runs here. Lady of the Light in behind them, just uh, going out of shot there. And also uh, uh, a very unlucky run from Life's a Beach, who's come up with a, very, a much better barrier draw this week. Michael, going into the series, you can see what it meant there to Johnny Cox, for these mares, I was thinking, oh, what's it going to be about? We've uh, got the likes of Brave View, Kelly, Stylish Memphis across the Tasman, Darling Me retired. Um, what's going to be left in terms uh, of these races? Well, we've got a big full field and a very open race. And although that race was a preferential barrier draw, this isn't the best mare in the country, you could argue, all American lovers drawn the outside. Yeah, very even field. I don't think it's a bad thing for a group one. There's not that standout all-stars type of horse who, you know, maybe a true fantasy who had it drawn well could have dominated a race like this. I still think All America Love is the best horse in the race. I mean, she's a proven group one horse. We saw that in the Queen of Hearts. Barrier nine's not easy, but they'll have no option but to put her in the race at some stage. And to be perfectly honest, Greg, I would go straight forward at the start. I think she would get the lead if they did that. So she's top pick, uh, $3 from the tab. Very fair for her, considering what she is. But I love seeing Folklore win so well last time. I think we've all known she had that in her somewhere at the lower levels. She seems to be in the zone at the moment. Maybe she stepped up her game by about two lengths, Greg. I think if she was able to repeat that, and to do that, I think she would need a hot speed and then a three-wide cover into the race over the last thousand. But if she was able to do it, I think it'd be really popular. Johnny Cox is a popular guy, and she's a horse a lot of people like. So the disappointments out of the previous race we just showed you with the Bob Butt pair, I thought yep. Kelly's Delight and Manhattan were both disappointing, and I'm not factoring them in for this race because of that. And I know most horses deserve at least one option or one chance to get it wrong, and you can still follow them, but I just can't have them. So for me, I don't think as many winning chances, even though it's quite even as in the other chances who could run second, third and fourth. I'd be very comfortable having a book of All American Lover and covering on folklore. And for me, that would pid you about 70% of the way home, Greg. Not exact science, but I just think there are two horses who on their recent performances are going better than most of the others here. Yeah, market says $3, as you mentioned, uh, for All-American Lover. Kelly's Delight from the inside, maybe not as much pressure early this time, so she'll be able to choose whether she stays there or maybe hands to an All-American Lover. $6 the price, eight fifty for Folklore. Uh, and then Lady of the Light, $10, and as I mentioned, Life's a Beach, $11, are a couple that interest me. A couple of really good races earlier in the programme, one over the mile and uh, it features Krug and this horse Mighty Louie. He's low flying, of course went to Australia, come back he's now won three in a row including winning in 152 at Nelson uh, part of the Robert and Jenna Dunn team and holding off one change here in Heisenberg. It was a, a pretty good performance Michael. He's come up $4.50. Krug at $2. $5 McAndrew Aviator who's actually a late nomination because uh, the Riverton Cup wasn't getting off the ground and then you're out to about $8 for Henry Hubert. Uh, I'll get your thoughts on that race in a moment, but here's Captain Tom. Uh, he goes around to race number five, and he's very, very good, Michael. He's got an awkward draw. Here he is beating with style. Uh, he's got a big motor, Alistair Black. He knows his way around a decent sort of a horse, and he's got himself one here. So first of all, how do you play the mile? And secondly, inside second row, it's not going to be easy for Captain Tom over the 1980. Yeah, the mile's really interesting. Not nice early race uh, on Friday night. 
Krug's the best horse, and he is on trial for the Miracle Mile. So if he wins here and wins well, he will head to Menangle for the Miracle Mile preludes on the 25th of February. He probably should win, but drawn barrier six, best case scenario, I would think, is that he's three back on the outside starting the last 800, unless they all go to single file and Carter Delgetti chooses to go park. As you mentioned, Mighty Louis went 152 at Nelson, which means he can go 152 around Addington if he chooses to do so. That would make it hard for Krug. $2 is a fair price because he should win, but I still think the best version of Krug is when he's able to settle, then get a head of steam up and be really fast over that last 800 metres. That's how he won the Invercargill Cup. I'm not sure he's a horse who likes sitting parked and trying to bully other horses. I'm not sure that's him and I doubt there'll be any handing up over the mile. So given the right helmet to follow, yep, he wins. Uh, if he has to sit parked and make his own luck, a lot trickier, as Crandall Getty said to me last night though, if we're gonna go to the Miracle Mile, we should be winning this. I just think it's a really tricky race. Um, I'm not against McAndrew Aviator, I think he's got a good chance if he can trial, uh, trail Mighty Louie, and Mighty Louie may not win the race, but he might stop other horses winning the race, Greg, because he's going to make it a very hard run affair. Interesting race. Um, yeah, interesting for Krug what happens next, because he went to Menangle last year. I think it suited him to have that campaign last year and toughen him up. And I think we might see a better version of Krug in 2023 than we saw in the first half of 2022. Yeah, well, we saw his stable mate, Republican Party, and we'll see that later on in the program, uh, win really nicely there on Saturday night. So excellent program at Addington. You've got the Breeders, which has been run since the early 70s and won by the likes of uh, Bonnie's Chance, your favourite horse, uh, three times, and Blossom Lady. And then you've got that mile and this up-and-comer, Captain Tom. So looking forward to the 10-race program there. The other meeting we have is on Thursday night. We'll preview some of those races shortly, but the reason it's an Auckland Trotting Club meeting uh, being run at Cambridge, uh, we're about to find out uh, what has unfolded with the Alexandra Park track. We caught up with the national uh, man in charge of uh, such things. His name is John Denton. John, 10 days ago, you made your way to Alexandra Park. Describe to me what you saw. Yeah, to be fair, Greg, it was just total devastation. Um, real surprise with the damage. Um, the amount of rainfall that they received, I think they're talking something like 350 mils of rain and uh, there was some significant damage to the track and the base. It exposed a lot of the track and, and having a look through some of these photos and when you start getting three and four layers down, were you surprised at what you found? Yes, yes, there's, there's some material that I haven't seen before. Um, firstly, you know, you've got your racing surface, which is your crushed shell, um, but then underneath that there's various different layers of old black crusher dust, there's cinders, and uh, then below where it was exposed was the actual um, crushed rock which is the base of the track so that was all exposed and it's um i would say the best part of you know two thirds of that has made its way to the pylon line and beyond so uh, it's a big job ahead yep all right so basically we're out of play for a month at alexandra park and it's going to take that long to to get the surface back how confident are you that it can return to its best yeah look i've indicated to the club you know if everything goes well and we tick the boxes, you know, we could complete it in somewhere around the 10 to 12 days, but that could be extended. Um, the thing is, it's what is, is unknown. It's what we can't see. And um, what damage is actually down on the, especially around the pylon line, um, where there's probably at least two to 300 mils of material sitting there. So it's not until we actually expose that that we actually get any understanding of the damage that we've got to, um, do to complete the job. All right. As if you weren't busy enough, you're in the middle of preparations for a coast to coast, which you guys are raising some money for the Horse Ambulance Trust, which is a fantastic gesture. How's the training going? Well, certainly a bit new to me. Um, probably getting a bit old for it, Greg, but uh, being talked into it. So um, I'm confident I'll complete it, and I think uh, certainly won't be first past the post. But uh, if I can complete it, it'll be a bit of a ticket box, uh, tick box uh, scenario. Yeah. Let's start with the track, Michael, because uh, obviously you are well aware of how much rain there has been about in the Auckland region, and some of those uh, photographs were pretty graphic. Yeah, 
First things first, obviously the track was damaged a little bit worse uh, where the apartment complex is, and that's because obviously there's bigger drains, there overflow drains which went onto the track, but that didn't cause this problem. The problem was the entire track, and once you're going to fix part of the track, you might as well be fixing the whole thing. So let's not be getting carried away that the apartments have caused this problem because they haven't. It was torrential rain. I, I'm from Greymouth, where we're experts on rain, and I've never seen anything like it. It was just 12 hours of just hosing down, little break, and then another 12 hours of hosing down. So you can't plan against that. Uh, tracks are cambered, of course, and therefore water ruts into them, runs to the bottom, takes all the top with it. Terrible situation for the Auckland Trotter Club, who just keep getting kicked in the guts again and again and again. They're, they're not going to fold up. They're not going anywhere. They'll still be here, Greg. The track will get fixed, but they didn't really need that. Uh, well done to Cambridge. There's people who five years ago were suggesting Cambridge wasn't needed and we could close Cambridge and just have Alexander Park. Well, thank God we didn't. Um, Cambridge are picking up an enormous amount of slack here and they're going to do a good job. Spoke to David Branch yesterday. They are into this. They are going to make this the best possible harness million next week they can. And they'll try and get the Gallops people there and say, hey, come along, have a beer on the lawn, enjoy this for what it is on a, a summer's night. So. We need to work together on this, Greg. Um, Alexander Park will be back, but they need fine weather to repair it. It's better in Auckland now, but is it going to stay fine for 10 days? I have no idea. Yep. So it's a complicated thing, and it's not a great thing. It, it's, it's something which really hurts a lot of people in the industry. But when you look at Cambridge on Thursday night, there's those good Auckland Trotting Club stakes there for those Cambridge horses to race for. And, Maybe it will say to some of those Cambridge trainers and the trainers further down the line, don't be scared of going to Alexandra Park once it's fixed. This phobia of going to Alexandra Park to take on God knows who, I don't know who they're scared of. Um, this phobia's got to stop because yep. they're the same horses at Cambridge racing this Thursday. He would have been racing at Alexandra Park predominantly and they're beatable. So let's hope that's one silver lining out of this rather dark clouds that have hung over Auckland for quite some time. Yeah, exactly. And the back end of that, uh, a nice wee uh, moment there with John Denton. He, along with their IT man, Andy Ross, and of course Brian Thompson, the CEO, uh, combining to, to go uh, coast to coast. And you can go to that Give a Little page, uh, just enter the New Zealand Horse Ambulance Trust uh, in the search engine, and I think they're up over $4,000. So uh, good on them, Michael. Uh, as John said, he's probably not the athlete he once was, or maybe thought he was, but they're getting involved and um, raising some good money for, for something that's so important important across all codes here. Yeah, and a really tough thing to do. You've done the coast to coast. My brother Barry's yep. done the coast to coast. I'm good on them for having a dig at it and trying to raise money for a, a really important part of our industry, looking after the animals as best we can. So, yep, as if John didn't have enough on, he gets to run from one side of the South Island to the other. Got a bit more. You mentioned uh, that Alexandra Park meeting uh, coming up on Thursday night. A couple of races to preview for you. Gee, this horse is in good form. He goes around every week rough and ready. Uh, he was very brave on this occasion for the Simons and uh, he'll be very competitive again this week, Michael. Yep, he just turns up every week. He turns up against Coffee that of winter. He turns up against these horses in summer and he can pace a 55 half pretty much every week he turns up. So Arna Donnelly, Quinella, that the Cambridge Gold Cup. Slightly more difficult field this week because it's a mobile. And while he's good from the mobile, there's a few inside him he might try and get in his way. Here's the star of the show, Merlin. This is Merlin on the outside. This is a workout last Saturday at Cambridge. That's him outside beating Major Perry. Now, Merlin is back in a three-year-old race, drawn the outside of the gate on Thursday night, Greg. Um, this is the lead-up to the Harness Million, and the Harness Million's come around really quickly, and most of the horses haven't had a chance to have a lead-up race. This being the only northern lead-up race, and we'll get to the Purden horses in a second, uh, it means that I think, Greg, everybody's going to want to have an easy run and, and not give themselves too much of a headache because next week's worth 200 grand. I spoke to Scott Phelan about Merlin. He said he, he felt really good in that workout, and they are hopeful from barrier eight. He can dominate the race because they're hoping the others also don't want a headache before next week. It may not matter. He should be too good. Uh, Charlie Brown, Ulta Meteor, um, Son of Max, a good horse. There's enough inside him, Greg, to make it interesting, but he's only been beaten once, Merlin. I think he'll win again. 
uh, just on Major Perry, he's on the outside of the gate in that rough and ready race a little bit later on. Crystal Hackett will drive him so he can get into that race. Scott said he can win, but again, he will improve. So the workouts last week, a key indicator to this week, just on workouts, the Purden uh, horses weren't able to get to Auckland, Greg, in time to race at Cambridge. They came up a bit later. Thursday night was too early for them. They will head to Cambridge on Saturday. So they'll have horses like Sherlock and Sinbad. They'll have their last workout before the Harness Million this Saturday. Right. So they're going in fresh, but they did have good workouts last week where they were really strong to the line uh, against the likes of Millwood Nike. But they'll be fresh. Merlin will have a run under his belt. Barrier draws for the Harness Million, which of course is at Cambridge on Friday week, will be crucial. But at this stage, it's more advantage Merlin than it is advantage the Purden team. It used to be Purden Cullen, it's now the Purden team. Of course, with Nathan joining in, uh, they are coming north. There were eight on the truck, also coming north, Self Assured and Akuta. So they are also now in the north, along with Millwood Nike, and they will prepare for different races. But the first cabs off the rank, obviously the boys in the Harness Million and Millwood Nike, and the girls Harness Million, Greg, for which she, of course, is a very hot favourite. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Michael, just while we're on Cambridge, um, we talked pre-Christmas about them wanting to have a forum with industry participants about the sh state of harness racing in the North Island. Um, they've actually come up with a survey, which it's a little bit like if you don't vote at the, uh, at the election time, you don't really have a say. So if North Island trainers, and they've all been sent it via email, or they can go via social media, and it's about a 10 minute survey on the state of the game, and you can have your say, and it's all anonymous. If they don't do that survey, then yeah, basically, um, you're not a voice anymore, for mine anyway. Yeah, I agree with you. I think David Branch and the team at Cambridge have said, look, there's a few different factions and um, there's some disagreements. The ATC aren't getting on with harness racing in New Zealand. That's, that's not a secret, everybody knows that. And I think we need to sit down and say, well, what are we trying to achieve? And how are we going to try and achieve it? Because one thing for sure is we're only going to achieve it together. Harness racing is not big enough to have a North Island faction and a Canterbury faction. We've tried that, it didn't work. So I think if we can get people on the same page, first get the data together, then get people in some rooms and say, what are the primary issues here? And there's no them and us, there's yep. just us. Yep. Because if you're part of the them and us, well, that ain't gonna work, Greg. Um, the Gallops are too big in this country now, and they're getting too much television coverage, the Gallops in New Zealand and the Gallops in Australia, for us to be um, Fighting in-house. Well, mm. it, 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 exactly. And the bottom line is the funding all comes via the TAB and runs through Harness Racing in New Zealand. So if you wanna argue with them, you're only arguing with the people who are paying your bills. It, it's tricky stuff. I'm not saying it's easy, and I'm not saying there's any easy way to solve this. But giving your opinion, first of all, and then getting people in a room together and having unemotional as possible debate, and I understand why it's emotional, Greg, because it means yep. a lot to people. But having those debates with a lack of parochialism, hopefully, is going to help find some common ground. And good on Cambridge for trying to lead the way on that. Yep, absolutely. They're leading the way for sure. And looking forward to the Harness Million with New Zealand Bloodstock and with getting really close to the sales. More about that later in the show. We mentioned some milestones either side of the this break. Coming up, our first break, uh, we're going to have a look at a couple of those. Sarah O'Reilly got to win at number 200. Yes, she did it uh, while we were away from the box seat. And this is her getting there with Lone Wolf. And Liberty, Oliver North, Lone Wolf with one last dive, the outside, he's flying Lone Wolf and got up right on the money line. Lone Wolf for a big win. Sarah O'Reilly's been able to get him home and there's 200. She can raise the bat for the double ton. And here is the second of our 200 win club, of course, uh, Matty White, likeable guy, got well past 200 with the time he spent in WA, but this is domestic win, so congratulations to him with Mocha Francie getting a fancy, rather getting the job done on the grass, and 
Uh, he's always been a good horseman. Uh, he's getting a few uh, decent sort of outside drives now. Drove uh, Manhattan, of course, when it came north, Michael. And um, he's always smiling and he's very, very talented. And he joins that club too. Yeah, and overcame a bad accident about three or four years ago where he got bashed up at, uh, at Cambridge one night. So good guy. Everybody likes Matty. Uh, good driver. As you said, he's getting better drives now and hopefully that snowballs for him because uh, he's doing a really good job when he gets behind good horses, which he doesn't very often. Yep, and the next of our milestone people will be Nathan Williamson. He's just two off joining the 1,000 Win Club, and he's got there very quickly. He'll join his brother Matthew. I think he'll be about the 27th to do that, so obviously we'll do a feature piece on him when that happens. Team Teal's underway, if you hadn't noticed. Uh, we are right into that six-week period once again. I've got a chance to catch up with one of their ambassadors at Addington on Friday night, Gemma Thornley. Well, it's been a special campaign for a few years now, and I'm sure, Gemma, you're pretty pleased to be part of that this year. Yeah, it's always a goal to get a win for Team Teal. Um, been lucky enough in previous years to win the Coast Teal competition, so that was quite a good thrill. But to be an ambassador is, like, even cooler, yeah. yeah. All right, we go to the first race, or the first win this year's series uh, with Lizzie Richter, and, um, yeah, it's a pretty cool way to start things. Yeah, exactly. First race in the whole um, Teal campaign, and to win it was pretty good as my first year as an ambassador so it's already a wee monkey off the back I suppose and yeah. What about in terms of the six week program what, what would be a pass mark for you how many wins would you like to achieve or is it not really like that it's more about spreading the word about ovarian cancer? Uh, a bit of both <laughs> always probably be happy to get like five wins um, I feel like I've had a good start to the season um, and I'd like it to keep continuing so five wins would be a really good um, goal, but also yeah, getting the spreading the word out there and getting women checked out is a big part of the campaign. And what Harness Racing is doing for the campaign is a massive achievement. Right. You work alongside Sam Otley, who's been part of uh, the ambassadorship, if you like, for a wee while. Is she giving you any advice, or is it still pretty cutthroat out there on the track? Uh, still pretty cutthroat out there on the track, but yeah, no, she helps me out a lot, and yeah, pretty cool for both of us to be doing it. You've got things off on the right note. Congratulations on that and good luck over the next six weeks. Thank you very much, Greg. Yeah, it's got off to a flying start too. Up over $5,000 raised already. I think they've had 17 wins split amongst uh, 10 different drivers. Uh, big starts for Kieran Tomlinson and Sarah O'Reilly. And, and Michael, uh, it's across the Tasman as well. It's an important part of uh, Harness Race New Zealand each and every year. And um, yeah, people like Gemma Thorney. By the way, that was Samantha Rotley doing all the work in the background. She wanted me to pass that on. Um, also, Greg, if you, if you back a winner, which, don't you back a winner, anybody drives, but if you back a winner that one of our wonderful female drivers drives, don't be scared to, to go to the Harness Race New Zealand page, find the link and donate. It doesn't have to just be them donating or other people donating and the studs and all that sort of thing to support these drivers. We can all do it because we all have females in our lives. And, and you know, if we can do anything to raise awareness, but more importantly, have money for research against uh, this insidious ovarian cancer, then let's try and do that. So if you're back a winner and the person driving it was wearing teal pants, maybe have a little thought, if you've got the wherewithal to do so, to drop 10 or $20 in, into that cause. All right, let's go across the Tasman uh, with Garrards, and it was the AG Hunter Cup. Michael, you were there. Uh, this is just over a lap out. Old Town Road's making his move around along with Rock and Roll Do, and in the not-too-distant future, copy that pulls out. Spirit of St. Louis in front, and decided Jack Callahan he was staying there, and that's why the lead wasn't there for copy that, and just out of shot, he's pulling out of the race, Michael. That's the most significant part where that gap is there. Yeah, so let's talk about copy that first. The winner is usually the horse you talk about, but he was the favourite, and of course he's the dual New Zealand Cup winner. So he had a dig for the lead, and he missed it against Spirit of St. Louis. Started to over-race. Obviously, Blair's a very experienced horse person, so there was nothing to be done. Choked down, and then he was found post-race to have had a bleed, a grade three bleed. He has therefore stood down for 28 days. He's had something similar, not as serious before, and come back and won a New Zealand Cup. So we're not too concerned about his future, but of course he can't do it again. Race goes on. Old Town Road is sitting parked. Here's the move that wins the race. Three wide with cover is Honolulu Bay, and Honolulu Bay has the option to come four wide, but that's not much fun. David Moran wins the race here. 
ducks down to the inside, gets the passing lane and way too good. One of the good guys, David Moran, driving for one of the great trainers in Emma Stewart. Here's the closing stages of the Hunter Cup out wide as the Inter Dominion champion, I cast no shadow. Honolulu Bay hit the lead. Honolulu Bay drew clear. David Moran and Honolulu Bay. Honolulu Bay wins it. Great go for the Miners. I cast no shadow in Old Town Road. So a pretty ecstatic David Moran. Uh, won the race a couple of years earlier with Lock and Var Art. And of course last year it was King of Swing. He was very, very good two weeks earlier, wasn't he? Uh, in the Ballarat Cup behind Copy That and he rounded them up nicely. Old Town Road has arrived. We knew he was uh, right in Town Hall Company, Michael, with his performances at Cup time and this trip will only harden him up. And for mine, he now is the horse to beat in any race he lines up on the Grand Circuit and I think in the race by Grins, a very, very shrewd move by the Hydroflow team. I spoke to John Dickey as trainer, I said, here's what you need, you need to find some gate speed. And it's not that it's not there, they're being reluctant to use it, but that's what they need. That changes him from being a horse who has one way of winning races, which is settling back and coming later, to what he has from a standing start, which is a horse who can just blast forward and, and, and dominate a race. He gets in front around Cambridge, you're right, he's the horse to beat. If he doesn't develop that gate speed and has to come from behind self-assured or a coot or copy that, then he's not, but I agree with you, he, he's got a massive motor. Um, Honolulu Bay's come through the Inter Dominion, which was bloody hard work, yep. and, and bounced out of it a better horse. Good on him, like, that's really hard to do. And Emma Stewart and Clayton Tonkin, um, this is another step toward them fulfilling what they their potential as trainers, what they could be, and that's been consistently a factor on the grand circuit. So yeah, he's a good horse. I cast no shadow, was really good, I thought. Um, some of the others, you can feel this open class bunch are getting a bit tatty, a little bit like expensive ego. They're getting a little bit tired. Uh, maybe he'll be better back at Menangle. But then we have horses like Captain Ravishing, Republican Party, we'll see shortly, and Catch a Wave, who are going to come in along with Leap to Fame and fill those gaps, Greg. Yep. So that transition's starting, and it's going to continue through the carnival at Menangle because the four-year-olds haven't joined in on that side of the Tasman. They have over here with the Kuta into the open class fray but they're about to, and the question is gonna be, not so much whether they can beat them in the mile races, like the Miracle Mile, but how much they'll factor later in the season when we get to the staying races. So, interesting time for the open class ranks. All right, the Race by Grins news this week. Akuta, Cullen Breeding, no surprise there. No surprise either, rock and roll do. Um, since his Victoria Cup win, well, things just haven't gone his way at all, Michael. No, so there's four horses who are now guaranteed in the race. So. Uh, obviously Old Town Road, Better Eclipse, well done to the team of Better Eclipse. They've got a really good horse and, and a consistent horse. He'll head to the Miracle Mile Carnival. Akuta was always going to get Ian Dobson's spot and Self Assured has been retaken by SEN and SENZ, same team who won the race last year. Yep. Rock and Roll Do, taken by the Aussie lads. He's dropped out, he heads to the paddock. Been a dreadful campaign for him. They are going shopping as well. Uh, the deal was basically done for Copy That. So copy that will be taken by one of the syndicates. And BD Joe has several offers. Steve Stockman said we're not making a decision to after the Miracle Mile. Krug also has offers. He'll be in the race by Grins unless something falls off for him. So more or less, six spots taken. Yep. Uh, a horse like Bondi Lockdown is on the shopping list for a couple of people. They're not making a decision to after the Miracle Mile either. You would think a Bondi lockdown McCarthy type horse is potentially going to end up here. And then the question is, does Emma Stewart want to travel any of her horses? Captain yep. Ravishing's apparently a no. Honolulu Bay will get offers, but they don't seem to want to travel with him. And there's also a race in Perth the same night. So yep. four invites done, six more than likely done. Maybe that becomes seven, because I think BD, Joe and crew both get a slot and then we're left with about three slots afterwards, Greg. I don't expect any more major signings until after the Miracle Mile on March the 4th, just because people don't know how well their horses are going. And there's this whole Perth thing, Spirit of St. Louis is heading there. I right. don't think many of the top Eastern, sea, uh, Eastern Seaboard horses will head to Perth, but that might make it a tricky decision for a couple of people. All right, great to get that update on the race by Grins. It was also a great Southern Star night on Friday night. You were there. Talk us through these heats and ultimately the final one by Just Believe. Well, 
Gatesby was a crucial factor. So here's Plymouth Chubb, who was a pretty good three-year-old last year, and he's very quick off the gate for Kieran Manning and Peter Manning. Uh, he led all the way, storming down the outside. Uh, was the horse who would ultimately go on to win the final. So once again, an easy run of the heats, a big help heading into the final. It was just believed down the outside. Here's Majestic Man a leading, and I thought he probably should have won this heat because he had an easy enough time. The horse who did win really jets a pretty good horse. So probably no real pot on him, but Majestic Man, okay, but did suggest that he was going to be in trouble in the final. That trouble deepened because he ended up drawing barrier seven, which meant he had no chance in the final. In the final itself, lovely drive by Greg Sugars, who is now becoming the king of the trotting drivers because he's won the last two into the minions. He had the option here, he's in the trail, to move out early and try and go to the lead, and he stayed in the trail behind me, Fast Metro, won him the race. So he was way too good here. When you look at them going toward the line, he's going away from them, and while there's some decent performances behind him, um, to be perfectly honest, he was always going to win once he got that sort of run. So he's become the best trotter in Australia where he sits against the Kiwis, Greg. Well, I don't know, but at the moment it doesn't matter because most of our good Kiwis either aren't going there or are having no luck when they do go there. So just believe can sit over there in Australia and win a truckload of money. Majestic Man has options this week, Greg, and also heading towards Sydney. So... Um, he'll still get his expenses back because, of course, he won a race the week before. But, yes, no luck on GSS night for him. Yeah, goes round, of course, in the night. Pistol takes on the likes of Plymouth Chubb and uh, Mufasa Metro. So looking forward to that at Melton on Saturday night. Uh, he's come up with barrier six, so hopefully he'll be competitive in that. Right, let's go to Sydney Michael and the pale face Adios. Uh, looking forward to this week. Um, there's a few there. Can't find a better man who we know pretty well. Uh, it's a very even race. Uh, it goes about 10 o'clock New Zealand time just prior to that. And we see Catch a Wave in Sydney. Yeah, so he went round in a 1,200 metre race at Melton last week, Catch a Wave. There's a bit of talk he should have gone to the Hunter Cup, but thank God he didn't because he, he would have had no chance. Uh, so he's actually ended up in the right path. So he's gone to a 1,200 metre race. He's won. Uh, he'll head to this week where he, he's a really good horse. And it's not that he's not good enough to have been competitive at Hunter Cup, but he's just not ready for 2,700 metres. He's mentally not that sort of horse yet. So um, the reason, that's why he didn't contest any open class races on the way through. So I think he's a better horse and can't find a better man. It is tricky for Victorian slash New Zealand horses to go to an angle because it's such a different type of racing. And if he happens to finish in the top three or four this week, he'll get into the Chariots of Fire, which is on Saturday week. And waiting for him there will be Republican Party. And, uh, of course, Captain Ravishing. Captain Ravishing was awesome last week. He is awesome most weeks. He wins his races by very big margins in very quick times. And he's the horse to beat in the Chariots of Fire. Uh, he's still got to go to an angle and adapt, but it would seem to be suitable for him. And then maybe he's the horse to beat in the Miracle Mile as some of these open class horses start to get a bit tired. Waiting for both of them, Catch a Wave and Captain Ravishing, uh, in the Chariots of Fire, that's 250 grand Saturday week, is this horse, Republican Party. Um, he's been very good over the last six months in New Zealand. Here he is fresh up for the first time in eight weeks, winning in the hands of Carter Dalgetty and doing so really impressively. Spoke to Cran last night, he said, look, we're there, we can't be scared of the Australians, there's no point doing that, we'll give him his chance. This is the Australian everybody's scared of. Here's Captain Ravishing last week, just wins by enormous margins. The horses he's beating aren't that good. Um, sometimes the Victorian form's enormously embellished by the fact that you're just racing the same horses every week. But we've all seen enough good horses to know that this is a proper horse. And maybe he's a superstar. We'll find out more over the Sydney Carnival. Um, there's a lot of real hyperbole about this horse. And there's no guarantee that he's even the best four-year-old in Australasia. There's no guarantee he's in the top two four-year-olds in Australasia. Because when he beat, raced Leap to Fame, Leap to Fame thrashed him in a derby. I don't think Stayings is go. And he hasn't yet performed at the same level that Akuta has. Now, Australians will get all upset about that, but they get upset about lots of stuff. Um, Akuta has run fourth in a New Zealand Cup, 
and won a New Zealand derby by a very big way and won a Hannon Memorial. Now that's a better block of form than what Captain Ravishing's doing. It's just not quite so dramatic in saying that he did win the New Zealand derby by a very, very big margin. So Captain Ravishing's faster than Leap to Fame and a cooter in two years' time, would he be better? There's no guarantee of that. Um, someone said to me last night, a very good trainer said, there's a lot of ride high about this. Yes. They're winning by massive margins and he's the next superstar, but will he still be a superstar in a year? Yep. I don't know the answer to that. I'm looking forward to finding out together, but I temper my conversations around these things, Greg, because I haven't seen evidence yet or proof yet that he's better to leap the fame or better than a cooter. And we may not get to examine that proof until the end of the year, but it's going to be mm. fun watching him go through the Miracle Mile Carnival. And at the moment, he deserves to be favourite for the Miracle Mile, but uh, it's a different tr different race on a different track and against very different opposition. Yeah, absolutely it is. 150.90 rated for the 17.20 there on Saturday night in the $100,000 Bonanza. Sibelius so Stakes uh, is the key lead up to what is the Queen Elizabeth II. It's still called that, the old ladyship. And Brave View Kelly, uh, well, she'll go round at it. She's got a good barrier draw of uh, two. Jack Trainer trains, of course. Stylish Memphis is in there too. Uh, well, she got the better of Stylish Memphis on this occasion. They went 150. Um, two very, very expat Kiwi mares, very good expat Kiwi mares going head to head again, Michael. Look, I, I think. Stylish Memphis is still the better horse. She tends to draw a lot worse, obviously, because often these races at Menangle um, are pre preferential draw. But I'd still be with Stylish Memphis to win the Queen Elizabeth for the third time uh, in two weeks' time. Talking about Menangle, this is yesterday, this is Tuesday afternoon. Looking at the second horse here, Kalua Flyby, gets up to win its Australian debut and 153 and change. Had to move around mid-race, did... Tim Williams to sit parked and he drove the horse beautifully so also drove BD Joe to win last Saturday I thought really good on this occasion Carlo a flyby she'll need to be better to win the New South Wales Oaks but she probably should be better she should should continue to improve and the word is that most of the leading Victorian fillies Greek aren't heading north for the New South Wales Oaks so therefore uh, I think Steve Telfer and the team have picked the right race to go to. So they have uh, contested two races with three horses over the last couple of days at Menangle, and they have won both of them. So a good start to their Australian push. Absolutely it was. BD Joe going 150.6 first up, sitting parked. Doesn't happen very often at Menangle. Powered up really nicely to the line and got the job done. Uh, back in the field, Alter Wise guy didn't really get a whole lot of luck. So uh, I could see him improving off that. And of course, they are heading towards those uh, Miracle Mile qualifying races on the 25th and ultimately, hopefully, the Miracle Mile uh, the following week. The other win uh, of, of note from an expat Kiwi was Zeus Bromax winning at the Newcastle Cup there on Friday night so uh, continues his very good run of form. About to take another break here on your box seat but Jordan Bublitz at just drive number two picked up win number one. Joe Stevens was very kindly out and about for us uh, at Cambridge and got a chance to have a chat to her about what it was like to drive your first winner. So many times in kids cart, second time of asking and Jordan Bublitz gets her first win. Jordan Drive two, win one, amazing. I must say, I bet halfway through you thought you wished you weren't in that position. Yeah. But you come around the turn and Jizzy travelled nice and how exciting for you. Oh, absolutely amazing. Like I'm over the moon, you know, he's racing pretty strong there through that whole thing and I wasn't too sure if he'd make it, but he kept going for me, so I'm bloody stoked with him. <laughs> pretty exciting for you to do it in those colours as well. Of course, you've worked with Tony Hurley, he has plenty of experience with the trotters. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. Oh, I've been there. Oh, just over two years now, and like having a grounding with Tony's been really good for me. You know, he's a, he's a phenomenal teacher, and I mean, who better to learn from? So I'm loving my work there, getting to sit behind some quality horses, so it always makes it better. Good on you, lady. Thank you. Now, you are a Kids Cuts graduate. I think, is that where the love of the sport began for you? No, absolutely. I actually remember I used to do BMX as a child. I remember Dylan used to do BMX too. Wendy used to come and be watching the training, and I'd stand there and go, when can I do Kids Cuts? <laughs> So it all started then. They finally cut me loose and I ran back. And here you are now, a moment no doubt you've dreamed of for a very long time. Absolutely. Good on you, Jordy. Enjoy. Thank you.
In your home straight, in your box seat, and it is almost yearling sales time. Of course, the tour is underway at the moment, and um, gee, there's some good reports coming out about a number of the drafts. Uh, Brecon Farms have been great supporters of the box seat over the last three years. We've got a chance to have a look at another four of theirs going to this year's sale. Of course, they've got 36, 23 colts. So let's start by having a look at lot number nine. The Muscle Hill out of Alana Hall. Only three Muscle Hills in the sale uh, right across uh, both Auckland and at Christchurch. Uh, Alana Hall's a sister to Highgate, the dam of uh, last season's unbeaten two-year-old filly in high energy. This is the Regal Volo family that has been made famous uh, by Brecon Farms. Uh, our 2010 comes out of that, the winner of 17 races, and of course Highgate herself won 16. Lot number nine, the Muscle Hill Alana Hall Colt. Uh, got the Brecon stamp there. Nigel Fahey and his team certainly doing a great job with their yearlings. Here's lot 74, one of eight Captain Treacherouses in the sale, seven of which uh, prepared by Breckens. Uh, this one out of Good Looking Girl, already left Al Mack, winner of 12 and half a dozen of those at Group 1 level. Uh, this is the same cross that's left. It's all about Faith uh, and Catch a Wave, who have just been talking about headed towards the chariot. A nice filly that uh, looks really good to the eye and paraded uh, beautifully on uh, this day. And again, the photographs you get to see uh, the update and how much they've developed in the last six weeks. The next lot is 103, and it's also by Captain Treacherous. Out of party on, of course, she was able to win her harness duel at just start number two, so group one winner very early on in her campaign. Multiple group one winner by the time she had finished. This one uh, by Captain Treacherous. This is the family of Lime Up and Life's a Beach who takes her place in the Breeders this week. If you are looking for a Captain Treacherous, seven of the eight being prepared by Breckens, as I mentioned before, and. Uh, the development of this cult from Nigel Fahey told me yesterday to now, you can see that incredibly uh, with the latest photos taken by Breckens. Go to breckenfarms.co.nz or nzbstandardbred.co.nz for all of the photographs and videos that are available for the 400 odd yearlings that are for sale. Last one we'll look at. Don't get any richly, more richly bred than this. Lot 123, the Better's Delight Colt out of Twist and Twirl. Uh, it's a full brother, of course, uh, to Better Twist, New Zealand Pacer of the Year. Half brother to three time and current Grand Circuit champion, King of Swing, who's now at start, of course, a two time Hunter Cup winner and a three time Miracle Mile winner. Uh, this is a really, really hot family and. Uh, He's a beautiful colt. Lot 123, the Better's Delight out of Twist and Twirl. Michael Guerin, when you see those four offered by Breckens, they have their stamp on them, and I reckon they're in for an incredible sale. They are. They'll be the leading vendors. They're, they're, they've got an amazing bunch of horses. What they've done is, is a really tough decision, but what they've done is they've gone down the galloping path, which is retiring a lot of their mares or buying other people's mares who are retired very young. So you're not seeing these trotting mares who have 60, 70, 80 starts, then hitting to start at seven. They're pitting horses like Highgate to start at four. Uh, and it, it's really working for them. And maybe it's the way forward for harness racing, Greg, is to get some of these black type horses, because it's so easy to get black type, and retire them at four rather than race them on to the six. Um, the bidders are uh, the uh, king of swing half, obviously is, is gonna be incredibly well sought after. Um, the party on horse, I bought the brother last year, the half brother, and we really like the horse. So there's an update there for you from the inside. We bought it with the Hurleys and, and um, we like the horse. And I put my, my family members into it, Greg. That's how much we do like the horse. Yep. Um, Captain Treacherous is doing a great job with those type of speed horses. So you're getting two different types of families. The Captain Tees, which are very different from the Better's Delights. But um, congratulations to Ken and Karen. It's a bloody hard thing to do what they've done. They inherited a lot of older broodmares, and if they hadn't culled those, they'd have old families. But they've got modern families, and they've got modern families with a lot of young mares involved. Um, they have done nothing short of a super job, along with their staff, led by Nigel, and bringing a draft. I'm looking forward to seeing a Karaka next week. Yep, absolutely, uh, Michael. A man who's 
going to be heading to the yearling sales uh, with a little bit more in the back pocket than he has in the past as uh, Bob Butt, I got a chance to talk to him at Addington on Friday night to talk about his success of last season and what he's looking forward to sales time. Sixth on the National Premiership, pretty good effort. Yeah, rap mate, sort of didn't see it coming at all really but just um, lucky to get some um, really nice horses turn up and um, great owners and great support and um, lucky I've got great staff and just all worked out un unreal. I know you were one shy of 50 and 50 would have been pretty cool but um, if I'd said to you at the start of the year you'll get close you would have you would have taken that. Oh for sure I would have been wrapped with 2025 you know but getting one short it gives us um, something to aim at this year try and get 50. Look some of the performers you had Manhattan obviously stands out I think there were half a dozen wins there horses like Kikarangi Blue Gold Chain won a couple of those breeders up north trotting races um, yeah there were a few stars there weren't there? Yeah just um, just some real nice horses that um, did a great job no champions you know but they um, yeah they just kept on ticking over all season and um, picked the wind up What about numbers wise how many have you got in work and what sort of capacity do you have? Um, at the moment I've got about 21, but um, you know I've got the capacity for more, well, pl plenty of room, like we've got unbelievable set up there that mum and dad set up, so um, you know there's always room for more, but I just try, try and, um, it's hard to do obviously all the time, but everyone likes quality over quantity. Yeah, they certainly do. It's a good time of year to start thinking about that because it's yearling sales time. So are you a guy who goes to this year's sale off the back of that success with a shopping list? Yeah, well, um, this year I've sort of um, got a fair few people quite interested and, um, you know, the last few years I've, I've sort of been a one, two or three sort of guy and I've just been relying on lucky to have um, owners that have bred their own, you know, turn up. Um, but this year there's a lot of people interested and um, there's some nice stock out there so hopefully we can find a couple of beauties. Bob, how do you go about it? Are you, are you a page type man or is it a bit of a combination? Um, well in the past probably I've just been a um, type sort of man and not so much to the page because I haven't gone there with a hell of a lot of money to spend but um, this year I think I've got um, a bit of coin behind me so I can sort of um, have a crack at both. If people are interested, I mean, your number's on the HRNZ website, is that the best way to, to go about it and um, you'll, you'll find them a spot in the bar? Oh, 100%, and uh, either that or me, just flick us an email, but um, definitely um, probably probably going to look at um, syndicating a couple for um, a couple of nice horses for decent sort of prices, so um, if anyone wants to jump in, um, give it a crack, yeah. He's had an incredible season. Um, how do you not like Robert John Butt, Michael? He's he's a character, uh, but I'll tell you what, what he's producing on the racetrack, uh, he, he's really standing up, isn't he? Look, he's bred to be good, but a lot of people don't get that right because they don't work hard enough. I, I had a horse a couple of years ago we sent down, which Bob looked after for about a month at the campaign in the South Island for a long time, and I had a renewed respect for what he was able to achieve. He was always a goofy sort of kid, and, and he looks a bit goofy. He looks a little bit like Woody from Toy Story. But he works bloody hard, and he comes from a family of people who know what they're doing, and he's now no longer goofy. He's a serious player. And, yep, yeah, I'd have no issues having a horse with him, Greg, which is the highest compliment I can pay to anybody because that's where you have to pay them the money. And if I had a horse with Bob Butt, I'd be more than comfortable with that. And if you're wondering why he's not driving at the moment, Michael, he slipped a disc in his back. He's actually going to the specialist today, Wednesday, to find out whether it's going to be an operation for him, which is not ideal, because I tell you what, his driving's improved immensely as well, so we, we wish him well uh, with that specialist visit, and uh, hopefully we'll have an update, uh, a positive update on that shortly. Uh, it is Horrata Cup week on Sunday, and uh, looking forward to that. Uh, the key lead up to that was uh, Amberley, who raced on Waitangi Day Monday. Here's Sam's Town getting through on the inside. Really good week for Gavin Smith. I think he picked up half a dozen, maybe even seven wins. Homebush lad down the outside, who's just had an incredible Country Cups campaign. Uh, Franco Merrick getting to the outside of his wheel. He'll improve immensely off that. He's a big brute of a horse, and he found the line really nicely. Uh, field's just not out at as we uh, recorded this morning for 
uh, this race, but you've got the likes of Dashing Mage, you've got you covered, Franco Norton. Um, it really is a decent sort of a, a field, Michael, but um, yeah, Gavin Smith doing some good things at the moment in the bike. Yeah, again, one of those drivers who, Greg, if he had better horses around him all the time, would drive a lot more winners. Um, he's had a tricky time with his team last year. They got a bit of a, a virus and they came up the back end of that heading into the summer. But yeah, obviously a very talented horse person who, when he gets those colours on in particular, uh, extremely hard to beat. So we have a quite a week in harness racing this week, the four meetings. So let's summarise that via the map, who Cameron J. Shaw produces for us each and every week. Always appreciate it. We've got that ATC meeting at Cambridge. Uh, eight races there. They start at one minute past six on Thursday. $90,000 Group 1 Fahey Fence Hire. New Zealand Standard Bread Breeder Stakes on an excellent program at Addington Friday night. Ten races, 5.23 the first there. Methfin, it's Hororata Cup Day. Eleven races. They start at ten past 12, they had about 150 noms and we've got dual uh, harness action on Sunday, that'll give us plenty to talk about on Trot's Talk with the Riverton Cup at the Ascot meeting there and Manawatu race twice next week, uh, Tuesday and Thursday, leading in of course to the New Zealand Bloodstock Harness Million meeting uh, next Friday night. So that's the harness racing action domestically for you. Uh, Michael, we've got some work to do on the best bets. We started off with a hiss and a roar. We got up to about three and a half thousand. We were kicking goals left, right and centre and eh, just waned a bit towards the back end of the season. So time for us to lift our game. Maldives are hard, Greg. They've both yeah. got to win, otherwise you don't get any money back. No, <laughs> um, correct. I actually found this, this a tricky week. I, I looked through both the meetings Thursday, Friday night really in depth and Thursday's tricky because a lot of horses are coming back and they've had mini breaks, 10 days off or two weeks off or a little bit longer in the case of Merlin. So just be a little bit careful with the Auckland Trotting Club meeting at, at, uh, at Cambridge. Um, I thought Blame It On The Night had a chance. He was luckless last start, was parked in a pretty good time the start before, probably finds himself at a race where he can lead. But yes, what is going to happen on Thursday, Greg, could be a lot of horses improving for the following Friday. Just little word of warning there. All right, race six, number four, blame it on the night for you. I like Paris Prince. Spoke to Blair Orange last night. Uh, he confirmed what I'd seen on the TV. Very unlucky, fresh up. I reckon it can nearly win him. Well, we might get three or four dollars, so I'd be pretty happy with that. Coney Island, Lou, into double time. Race six, number one, into race ten, number one, for our man, Graham Hand. It's good to be back, Michael. Um, bit of a sad time, too, because you were a big part of In The Gig for many, many years, but uh, our counterpart show in Australia is no longer, so I suppose that places more emphasis on us, trying to get as much about this sport onto your television screens as we can. Well, and YouTube. Um, these days, so many people watch their shows on their iPad or their phone, and look, you can get us every week on there. To the Australian viewers, we're going to be here every week, and we're going to have your racing on every week, and we're going to have opinions on it every week too, and we make plenty of phone calls into Australia. Don't worry, they're just one big country to me that is different states, so we'll make sure that we cover this Miracle Mile Carnival and the race and all the Aussies backwards and forwards, Greg, um, as in-depth as we can. But yes, very sad to see the finish of In The Gig, a show I was part of for 25 years and made a lot of friendships out of. Yep, certainly a sad time uh, there, but we will keep the, the wheels of harness racing going here with your box seat, courtesy of our stable of sponsors, and a massive thank you to them once again. Right, we'll see you, Michael and I, in seven days. The Box Seat, brought to you by our stable of sponsors. Harness Link, for your worldwide harness coverage. New Zealand Bloodstock Standard Bread, where winning begins. Brecon Farms, Stonewall Stud, IRT, it's your horse and our passion. Australasian wide Garrard's Horse and Hound. Renwick Farms, Lincoln Farms, Harness Racing New Zealand, and the clubs Addington Ashburton, Alexandra Park and Cambridge.